We welcome you today to Centenary United Methodist Church in Smithfield, North Carolina. We hope this hour of worship is a blessing to you, and we want you to know you are a blessing to us. Your acts are amazing, Lord. We cannot comprehend the number of blessings you pour out on us from day to day. As we gather today around your name, we pray that you would fill our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Transform us, Lord, and make us more like you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. amen. Now let us affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Ooh, I'm really loud. Warren, I'm super duper loud. Okay. Oh, all right. That's better. Sorry. I just didn't want to deafen all of you. All right. So, for our children's moment this morning, I, um, brought some things. So I brought pancake and waffle mix. Does anybody like pancakes and waffles? Yeah, we like pancakes and waffles, right? They may not be the healthiest food for us, but we like pancakes and waffles. And what goes on pancakes and waffles? Syrup. syrup. Good old maple syrup. At our house, we like to use the real, like, real stuff, but, you know, we've got maple syrup and so um, for our lesson today these represent the early church all right it was a group of people they were pretty tightly knit uh, they went well together and then there was something else peanut butter this represents paul or saul as he was known at that point in time do y'all usually think of peanut butter going with your pancakes? Not really, right? It's not an easy thing. And so Paul one time, um, Paul didn't like the early church. He was persecuting the Christians. And he got special permission from Caiaphas to go to Damascus and to arrest the Christians, um, bring them to trial, because he didn't like them at all. And so on his way there, he was blinded by a bright light. He heard the voice of Jesus calling, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he was struck blind. He went into Damascus where he waited and where Jesus brought Ananias to him and he had a mission. He was to go and he was to take the gospel to Jews and Gentiles and then all over the world. But Paul didn't always feel like he was a good fit in the new church. Sometimes he felt like he was on the outside looking in, especially right after he was forgiven. But do you know what God does with that? God says, you know what, this is a good recipe. We can add a couple of bananas in there. We can put a little peanut butter on our pancakes, put some bananas on them, and we've got a whole new way of being the church. All right, y'all try it, it's not bad. And if you've got any chocolate to drizzle over it, it gets even better. Um, but you know, sometimes the church isn't just what we expect. Sometimes there are other parts to the church that belong just as much and God makes a big new recipe out of his church family and that's what he did with Paul Paul felt like an outsider but God said no you belong in this mix that is my church and that's what he does for all of us that same grace that saved Paul on the road to Damascus is offered for each and every one of us each day and whether we're peanut butter or syrup or pancake mix we all belong in God's big family 
So let's say a prayer together. Almighty God, thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for the gift of your grace. Thank you for coming into our lives and bringing us together in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, announcements as we continue our time together this morning. I would like to start by announcing that the flowers on the altar are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Margaret Wallace by Margie Holder. And so we thank Margie for these beautiful flowers um, in memory of Margaret. Also this week, um, the Betty Sanders Circle will be meeting on Tuesday at 2 o'clock in Wesley Hall. So ladies, if you're a member of the Betty Sanders Circle, please mark your calendars to attend that meeting. Our sassy seniors will be having a spring fling Wednesday the 21st at 11.30. The All-American Food Truck will be back. Um, we'll be having a good time. Cost is $15 per person. If you would like to attend that, please contact me and let me know by tomorrow um, so that we can make sure we've got you signed up. We'll be eating in Wesley Hall, social distance, um, but we'll have a good time hanging out together. The United Methodist Women's Mother's Day Remembrance uh, was mailed out in the April-May newsletter. If you would like to participate but do not have your newsletter, that's okay. There's a couple of pink sheets of paper on the table in the narthex. You can fill one of those out. Um, those are due to the church office by Wednesday, April 28th to be included in the Mother's Day Bulletin. Senior Sunday reminder, um, if you've got a graduating senior this year, we need your photos for the slideshow um, and the information for the bulletin no later than Monday, May 3rd. So uh, we hope all of our seniors will uh, work to get that information to us. The trustees will meet Tuesday at 6 o'clock. The Finance Committee meets Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And the Staff Parish Relations Committee has a meeting on the 27th at 7 o'clock. So if you are on one of those committees, please um, mark your calendars. We will have MYF tonight at 5.30, and we look forward to seeing the youth in Wesley Hall. Um, please wear a mask, and, and we'll have a good time together. We're continuing to work through the Ten Commandments, so look forward to seeing our youth then. I believe that is all we have for announcements this morning. As I said in the early service, I think I'm forgetting something. But I don't know what it is, so we'll email you out whatever I have forgotten, um, because that's just the way it's going to be. I don't remember it, so whatever it is, we'll email it to you. But we will now turn to our choir as we continue to worship.
thank our choir for their ministry of music and our technology team for um, making it possible for us to continue to enjoy their music. At this time, I invite Carter Hines for the reading of our gospel lesson. <clears throat> Scripture comes to us today from the book of John chapter 21, verses 14 through 17. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Thank you, Carter. So much more concerning to me than the announcement I feel like I'm forgetting is as I go through this prayer list, I am certain I have left someone's name off of this as well. So um, if it's you, I apologize in advance because we do want to be praying for you. Um, we want to continue to keep him and Bev Hawkins in our prayers, um, lift them up at this time. We want to pray for Christy Fisher. We want to continue to pray for Fred Jensen. Um, pray for Bob Busby, who will have a procedure coming up this week. Pray for Tony Hamilton, Cindy Huntsbury, Mary Douster, Sarah Ann Sasser. We want to lift all of these up before the Lord and continue to be in prayer for them. Um, we want to be in prayer for the family of Vivian Campbell. That is Jennifer Foy's sister um, who lived in Cairo. She uh, entered the church triumphant this week, and so pray, prayers for the family and prayers um, for traveling mercies for Jennifer and Eddie as they are in, um, traveling. Uh, prayers for um, Neil Davis's family. His mom, Letha Creech, uh, entered the church triumphant last week. Um, service was yesterday, so continue to keep um, Neil's family in your prayers. And continue to pray for the family of Paulette Cooper. Um, also would like to ask that you pray for Creighton and his family. His dad is in hospice care um, right now, and they don't know how much longer. So continue to keep them in your prayers. Um, when we want to remember our homebound, those who have been so dear to this church, so pray for Betsy Stansel, Catherine Jolliffe, Jerry McArdle, um, as well as those who are in nursing homes, um, Ellen Powell, Ozzy Fields, Gladys Prince, Nisi Delaporte. Um, just keep lifting all these up. These are precious members of our congregation, as each of you are, that we want to, to continue to be in prayer for one another. So let us pray. Precious Lord, we breathe deeply of your goodness, and we come before you now. Lord, we come before you to bring our praise and our thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the many blessings in our lives. Lord, we especially want to thank you for the blessings that we overlook in our own blindness. Open our eyes that we may see your goodness each day. We thank you for friends and family, for brothers and sisters in Christ who worship with us this day. We thank you for the season of spring, for the new life that comes to the earth. Lord, we thank you again for Easter, for the new life you brought to each of us in the empty tomb, and the resurrection of our Lord. And Lord, today we thank you for the opportunity to gather. We thank you for our health. We thank you for this church family. Lord, we are also grateful that when we lift our prayers up to you, you hear us, that you, you share our concern for the burdens of our hearts. And so today, Lord, we pray for our nation, for the violence that once again seems to be so prevalent Send your grace, send your peace. May your will be done and your way be followed, Lord. 
We pray for those who we have named before you today. We pray for those who we hold in our hearts. For those facing times of illness, we ask your healing. For those fighting cancer, we ask for your strength and power. For those walking through the valley of grief, we ask for your comfort and grace. For all of those in need this day, Lord, we ask that you sustain them. Lord, we know that so many are feeling overwhelmed. So many feel tired and heavily burdened. Lord, we pray that you will walk with them this day, ease their load, and grant to them a special measure of your grace. And Lord, we pray for one another. Keep us strong in our faith, patient in our hope, and steadfast in our love. Ever as we pray, Lord, we offer to you our hands and our feet. Strengthen us, call us, lead us, Lord, that we might serve you in all that we say and all that we do this day and always. And hear us now, Lord, as we pray together the prayer your Son, our Savior, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forevermore. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward that we might return to God a portion of that with which he has first blessed us. may be seated. Thank you. Our second scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Acts, the ninth chapter. Um, it says verses 1 through 20 in the bulletin, but I'm actually going to quit um, at verse 19. Just Well, actually, I'll just read through 20. It's only one more verse. Here we go. Some very well-known words from the book of Acts. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. 
He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless, for they heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now at the early service this morning, I got to tell them that they had no idea how much danger they were in because my watch had broken. And they were dealing with a preacher with no watch. But y'all are lucky because someone from the congregation has loaned me a watch. So we are back on track here. So you owe someone a big thank you because you are no longer in danger. There's nothing worse than a preacher with no sense of time, right? So it's important that we have a working watch. But um, regardless, a few years ago, I uh, got into the website dog shaming. Anybody familiar with dog shaming? All right. How many of you own a pet? All right. Not as many as you as I would have thought. Really? All right. How many of your pets behave perfectly all the time? No. Pets aren't known for doing that, are they? Well, dog shaming is a website that came about because you would catch your dog in some form of mischief, snap a picture of the critter surrounded by the mess with a little sign up there saying, you know, what the dog had done, and you would post it to the Internet for all the world to see that um, your dog isn't the worst dog out there. You know, and you could look at all these other dogs and see what they were up to. And it's not just for dogs. Um, it it kind of became a trending thing. This one woman um, posted, this was about her dog, that uh, one hot summer night her dog decided to sleep in the bathtub. And this was fine with the lady, except she didn't know it was there. And when she got up early in the morning and it was still dark and the dog came leaping out of the tub, it uh, about gave her a heart attack. Or there was a, a house um, where the mother was a musician. She played piano. And she was trying to learn a new piece of music. And you know when you're learning a new piece, you always have that one spot you just can't get past. Genevieve, you know what I'm talking about? That one spot that's just kind of like a bump in the road. And, and you practice it and you do it wrong. And then you back up a measure and you practice it again and you get it right. Well, the bird, they had a parakeet. It learned to whistle her mistake. And so it would whistle all day long, up to the mistake, and back a measure, and then through. And then up to the mistake, and I mean, she was about ready to get rid of that bird. Or there was another family that had a cat. And as um, they would bring their laundry into the laundry room at the end of the day, if nobody sorted it and got it into the machine, the cat would return the laundry piece by piece to its rightful owner's door. So in the morning when you woke up, there would be a pile of your own dirty socks or whatever else you'd put in the laundry waiting outside for you. 
Now, my family has always had pets. Even when I was a little kid, we always had pets. And um, we don't have the best track record. We had some very memorable, memorable being a nice word, pets. Um, we had Chips, who was a Cardigan Walsh Corgi, who was obsessed with balls and was an amazing escape artist. Dog could get out of anything. We had Bingo, who was some sort of mutt. And Bingo was the terror of the UPS man. Okay, the UPS person would drive like back down our driveway and just toss the packages and gun it. Never would even get out of the truck. All right, um, and then <laughs> let's see. Uh, I won't even really get into my aunt's pets. I love my aunt. My aunt is the most kind and generous soul you could ever meet, and she can't turn away an animal. All right, and she has had some doozies. Okay, she had Tilly, the demon possessed Spitz. Um, she had Honey, the corgi who would climb out on the roof. And um, then she had Hershey, the counter-cruising spaniel. Don't ever eat anything my aunt offers you unless you're sure the dogs haven't been around. Um, and that, I'm not even going to get into her cats, okay? Always interesting pet stories. But um, when my brother was about six or seven, he got one of those grow-a-frog kits. Anybody's kids ever have a grow-a-frog kit? All right, well, it's this little cube aquarium and you fill it with purified water and you mail off and this company sends you a tadpole. And you put the tadpole in the aquarium and it eventually turns into an aquatic frog and voila, I mean, instant fun-filled pet, right? Can't do anything with it except put a little food in the thing. But my brother got one of these and um, it arrived and it transformed into an aquatic frog and was living in a cube in his room. And we were sitting down for dinner one night and my cat comes downstairs. My cat's a little soggy, and my cat's carrying the frog food in its mouth. Now, we don't know what happened to the frog, okay? But the aquarium was tipped over, and the frog was gone. So my brother was heartbroken, and my parents decided to get him a cat. I guess turnabout's fair play. Um, so they got him a little orange marmalade tabby. And you know what they say about ginger cats? Um, I've owned a few gingers. I can say that. But anyhow... This cat was named Rascal, and we don't know if he just decided to live up to his name or if he was named because of his behavior. Rascal turned into 18 pounds of the best purr you've ever heard in a cat. Anybody love cat purr? I love a cat's purr. That is like the best sound. Okay, Rascal had a great purr. That was about the only thing Rascal had going for him. Um, we had a fridge where the freezer was on top and sometimes the door would pop open. Rascal would hop in the freezer and eat frozen food. So you would open the freezer door and there would be this cat just chowing down on a frozen burrito or a frozen waffle or whatever he could get his hands on. Um, Rascal tipped over a gallon of paint on the carpet one time. Um, he could not stand a closed door. He would either sing the song of his people. Anybody got a cat that sings the song of its people? Okay, Rascal had a beautiful voice. He could sing for hours on end. Or if he knew without, you know, without a doubt that there was a person on the other side of that door, he would reach his paw under and bang, just pull on the door, slamming it into the door frame for hours on end. You would hear it all through the house at night. Boom, 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 boom. I mean, this cat was something else. And his favorite trick was he would get up somewhere near your height and he would purr, and he would lean in like he wanted you to put your face closer to him. And then he would bite right across the bridge of your nose. Every time. We, there was a joke in our family because at various points we all had scabs right across here. But Rascal, he was definitely a rascal. But my brother loved him. My brother loved Rascal so good just loved that cat. And so when I think about Rascal, I think a little bit about Grace because there wasn't a lot redeeming about that cat, but what there was, my brother treasured. And so when I read our passages for today, I, I think a bit about rascals. When are we rascals? Because, you know, no matter how difficult pets can be, we love them. And so this text is about two of the best-known people from the Bible, Peter 
and Paul. And now we don't like to think of them as rascals, do we? We want to think of Peter as the rock on whom the church was built. He's the natural leader of the disciples. And we think of Paul the apostle spreading God's word to Jews and Gentiles alike. But before they grew into these illustrious roles, they were both more than a little bit rascally. They both desperately needed grace. And so usually when I'm working with two passages like this, I like to take them chronologically. I'm really kind of obsessive about it. But today we're just going to throw that out the window um, because there's more to do with Peter's passage. We're going to start with Paul. Um, we all know this passage. I literally just read it a few minutes ago. We, we've, we're familiar with the conversion of Paul. Um, you know, he was on the road to Damascus. He had gone to get special permission from the high priest to persecute Christians. He was breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord. And, and so he decided he was going to go chase the disciples to Damascus. Damascus is a major city at this time, um, actually had been for a long time. It, it claims it's the oldest inhabited, continually inhabited city in the world. But whether it is or not, it was an old city, a well-established city. It was right on some trade routes. So it was an important place. And Paul decides that because Christians have gone there, he's going to go there too. And now we're not talking 20 or 30 years after the resurrection. We're looking at like two to three years. I mean, this is straight away Christianity has spread to Damascus. So we've got Paul, and he's basically a Pharisee in training. He is a devout Jew, and he's decided that his personal mission in life is to wipe out the followers of the way. That's what Christianity was called at this time, the way. And, you know, he was present at the stoning of Stephen. He... Um, he was just someone that people feared and they dreaded. He was set against Christians and the risen Savior they proclaimed. So you know the story. He's on his way to Damascus. Suddenly there's a bright light from heaven. He's struck blind. He hears the voice of Jesus calling his name. Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And, you know, he's, he's kind of realizing that he has been, oh, so very wrong. He's realized just how misguided he is. He asks, who are you, Lord? He's realizing there's something way bigger going on here than he thought. And Jesus tells him to get up, to enter the city, and he'll be told what to do. So it's interesting to note that in Acts, when we get one of these major visionary experiences, and there are a couple of them in Acts, the main purpose of that experience isn't to convert a non-believer all right, the, the spread of the, the church, its mission, its ministry, that was supposed to do that. These major visionary experiences, they might convert a non-believer, but their main purpose was to commission and call someone. So we can argue about whether we want to call this the, the conversion of Paul or the, the call of Paul. Um, call of Paul is a little hard to say, so I guess we'll just stick with, you know, conversion. But the point is there's more than just a conversion experience going on here. Jesus calls Paul. He pulls him out of his sin and his confusion, and he brings him into God's purpose. Now, Jesus tells Ananias something. And I want to take a side note here for just a minute. Usually when I preach this passage, I actually preach about Ananias. He is kind of the forgotten character here. But um, did you notice that when God calls Ananias, he tells him to go to Paul. He says, he's already seen a vision that you will come to him. God was so certain Ananias would do what he asked that he'd already sent Paul a vision telling him it was going to happen. And God didn't just ask anything small of Ananias. He asked him to go to the person he feared the most, someone who could throw him in jail, someone who could persecute him and his family. God knew that even though it was hard, Ananias would do it. He'd already sent Paul a vision. I just find that the most amazing thing, to think about what kind of Christian do you have to be for God to be so sure that you're going where he calls you. That's just mind-blowing to me. But anyhow, so Ananias says, God, you know, this guy, he is not a real good guy. Are you really, like, are we going to do this? And God says, yep, get up, go to him, heal him, and tell him what I'm about to tell you. Tell him that he is my chosen instrument to take the word to Gentiles and their kings and to Jews. You see, Paul is a chosen instrument. You want to know something? There isn't one person in the church at that point in time that would have chosen Paul for this mission. He is the last person anybody in the church would have chosen for this mission. But Jesus called him. 
Jesus chose him. Paul was a rascal. He was worse than a rascal. But Jesus chose him for more. Paul himself says, I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. Paul knew that his story, his purpose, his call was written in God's grace. So we look at our other rascal for today, good old Peter. Again, we don't like to think of him as a rascal, but at this point in the gospel narrative, Peter's put himself in a tough situation. Throughout Jesus' life and ministry, Peter was one of his key disciples. In the Gospel of John, Peter was one of the first four disciples called. He's technically the third. In the very first chapter of the Gospel of John, we are told this. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard from John the Baptist what what he had said about Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Right off the bat, Jesus knows exactly who he's dealing with. And Peter is close to Jesus. He's there on the mountain of transfiguration. He attempts to walk on water. He's the first to declare Jesus as the Messiah. But Peter, he's also so very human. He argues with Jesus about what it means to be the Messiah. He falls asleep at Gethsemane, and he denies Jesus three times. Now, some of you may be thinking, but Megan, this is a whole different category of rascal than what Paul was. I mean, Paul was breathing murder and threats against the Christians. Peter, you know, he was trying. But I think it could be argued that as Jesus' friend and trusted disciple, His actions might have been particularly painful to Jesus. Have you ever been hurt by a friend? You know, it's bad enough when you're hurt by somebody you barely even know. But when someone you trust hurts you, that cuts deep. That cuts really deep. And that's what Peter had done to Jesus. He had hurt him. He had denied him. And and so we're not here to, to put Peter and Paul on scales and evaluate who's the worst sinner, who needed the most grace. That's not the point. The fact is both of these guys were living outside of God's will for them, and they needed brought in. So we find Peter today. Um, He's denied Jesus. He's been scared and upset by the crucifixion. He's kind of uncertain about what this whole resurrected Christ even means. Um, He's a little stressed out. He decides he just really can't handle this. He's not sure what to do. So he returns to his old habits, the things he knows he can do. He's not sure if he's cut out to be a disciple, but he knows he can fish. So just prior to what Carter read today, um, Peter takes the disciples and they go out fishing. And they spend all night out and they don't catch anything. And they're starting to come back in and, and there's a, suddenly a stranger on the shore. And he tells them, let the nets down on the other side of the boat. Which, have you ever been doing a job and somebody who has no clue what they're doing tells you how to do your job? I mean, you can imagine kind of the eye rolling the disciples were feeling about this. Like, we are the professional fishermen. Like, it's the same water. The other side of the boat is going to make no difference whatsoever. But they're like, fine, whatever. They put the nets down. They have a miraculous catch of fish, so many that they can't even bring them up into the boat. And one of the disciples in the boat with Peter goes, you know what? I think that's Jesus. And Peter, got to love him at this point, jumps straight into the water and swims to shore. I mean, he's just like, wait, that's Jesus? Like, oh, I need to talk to him. Because if you look at the Gospel of John, Peter hasn't really talked to Jesus since the resurrection. Jesus talked to Mary Magdalene. He talked with Thomas. He's talked with the whole group of them. But Jesus and Peter haven't had like a sit-down conversation. And so I wonder when, when Peter jumped in the water, was it, I need to get there first. I need to tell him how sorry I am. You know, what, what was it Peter needed to do so bad that he would jump in the water? And so anyhow, he swims to shore and the rest of the boat comes up and And they have this breakfast together. And then our story continues continues, because Jesus looks at him and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, this is another point where people get really hung up in this passage. Why would Jesus call him Simon, son of John? So some scholars have said, well, it's because Jesus was hurt. Jesus was mad at him. He was showing the distance rather than calling him by his friendly name. Hey, buddy, 
He was calling him by this distant name. But I actually think it's the exact opposite. When Jesus first met Peter, he called him Simon, son of John. This is a brand new beginning for Peter. So he comes to shore, they're sitting down eating breakfast, and Jesus looks at him and calls him Simon, son of John. That was like his full name. And it meant that Jesus knew him. One of the um, liturgical elements in the church that that we do um, at baptisms, weddings, and, and funerals is we call someone at least once by their full name. And a lot of times when I'm doing weddings, the, the couple, especially if someone doesn't go by their full name, will be really thrown off by this. They're like, well, why, why do you need to call me that at this point in time? You know, like, why does it matter? And because it's symbolic. It is showing that you are fully known. God sees and recognizes you at this moment in your life, at the moment of your baptism, the moment of your wedding. God knows 100% it's you. And I think it's the same that Paul, or that God, that Jesus is doing for Peter right then. He's looking at him, and rather than calling him that nickname he gave him, he's saying, Simon, son of John. And that is your full, that, you know, when your parent calls you by all three names, I mean, that is your full identifying name. Jesus is saying, I know you. I know what you did. I know who you are. I know what you will be. But in this moment, I know you. And so rather than being a sign of distance, I actually think it's a sign of intimacy. Jesus wants to make sure Peter knows 100% he's talking to him. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And, and Peter, you know, I think he's probably a little bit hurt by this question. You wonder, you know, did he answer it with confidence or is he kind of downtrodden a little bit? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. And then it's kind of like Jesus is on that broken record. We skip right back. He goes, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And I think this time Peter looks up a little bit more sure, and he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, tend my sheep. And I think Peter's kind of thinking we're done here now, but we go one more time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And at this point, the Bible, you know, you notice when you read the Bible, it almost never tells us how people are feeling It's not a feelings book. Peter's feelings were so important at this point that it tells us. Peter was hurt that Jesus questioned him a third time. He says, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. And and so through this, you know, we get that threefold again. There were three denials. Now there are three affirmations. But this repetition again is to just drive into Peter The Lord knows you. You know, the Lord knows you. And the Lord forgives you. And so that is the significance here. And and not just that Peter is forgiven or that Peter gets to declare his love. Three times Jesus commands him to move forward in his life and faith. Jesus forgives Peter and he entrusts him with the work of looking after God's people. Forgiveness. Can you imagine how Peter and Paul felt when they received this forgiveness? How how the weight of their past failures would have been lifted off of them. That is truly an amazing grace. But Peter, he's not simply forgiven so that he can feel okay. Like Paul, Peter is forgiven so that he is called to serve the church, so that he can put his heart into this call, his mission, and his ministry. Both of these passages are about grace. They're stories of God's amazing grace, reaching out and forgiving sinners. Peter and Paul had both fallen short of God's will for their lives, just like we often fall short of God's will for us. We miss the mark. And so these passages remind us that even when we fail him, God forgives us in his grace and his goodness. And this grace is open to all. It's not just open to a few who deserve it. William Sloan Coffin once said, God's love doesn't seek value. It creates value. It is not because we have value that we are loved, but because we are loved that we have value. Or perhaps more simply, it's a little bit like a Dennis the Menace cartoon. Y'all know Dennis the Menace used to drive his neighbors, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wilson, crazy, right? 
but Mrs. Wilson continues to be kind and gracious to him. And, and in this particular cartoon, Dennis and his little friend Joey are leaving the, the Wilson's house, and their hands are full of cookies. Joey says, gosh, I wonder what we did to deserve all this. And Dennis answers, look, Joey, Mrs. Wilson gives us cookies, not because we're nice, but because she's nice. God is full of grace, and he chooses to share it with us, to restore right relationship with him. So these passages, they're about grace and how this grace is available to each of us, but they don't stop there. They carry on because they are really about what we are to do with our lives once we have received God's amazing grace. I know I've quoted this song to you before, but I find the words to Neil Diamond's Pretty Amazing Grace to be very powerful. He sings, Pretty Amazing Grace is what you showed me. Pretty Amazing Grace is who you are. I was an empty vessel, you filled me up inside, and with amazing grace restored my pride. Pretty amazing grace is how you saved me, and with amazing grace reclaimed my heart. Love in the midst of chaos, calm in the heat of war, showed with amazing grace what love was for. Gave me a truth I could believe in, you led me to a higher place. Showed your amazing grace when grace was what I needed. Look in a mirror, I see your reflection. Open a book, you live on every page. I fall, you're there to lift me and share every road I climb. One of the things I love so much about this song is that in it we see the transition from receiving God's grace to living into that grace. And this is what our passages today are about. Paul received God's grace, and then he began to live into it. He spread the gospel to the Gentiles and won countless souls to God's kingdom. But it is in the words Jesus speaks to Peter that we really see this laid out for us. Peter is forgiven, and Jesus doesn't just say, all right, Peter, well, try and do a little bit better this time. Peter's forgiven, and he is called into serving God, to tending his sheep. So here's the thing. The same, it's true for us. God's amazing grace will cover us. God will forgive us, no matter how much of a rascal we've been. God loves us, but God restores us and calls us into so much more. Peter, he's not forgiven so that he can feel good about himself, but so that he can serve the church with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. The miracle of forgiveness actually makes more work for Peter, but it's work that makes life worth living. The same is true for us. We are freed from sin so that we will be free to serve. If we truly love the Lord who gives us forgiveness, we will follow him and we will feed his sheep. Forgiveness and grace bring us into right relationship with God. Right relationship with God brings us to follow him. And we have a little problem here because society tells us not to ever be followers. There was a young lady, um, she was filling out her college application forms and um, her heart sank when she came to a question. The question was simple, check yes or no. Are you a leader? And wanting to be fully honest on her application, she checked no. She received this letter from the college. It said, Dear applicant, given that in our upcoming year, our college will have received 1,499 new leaders, we feel that it is important that there be at least one follower in their midst. So we are happy to welcome you to our family. Sometimes, we have to be followers. We want to be leaders, but it's like Jesus was telling Peter, follow me, follow my guidance, follow where I lead, tend and feed my sheep. We have to follow Jesus. So how do we do that? We follow his example, we follow his commands, we feed and we tend his sheep. And that is the work of a lifetime. It's not one quick, once and done, it's not like, you know, a quick task. It is something we do every day. To feed and to tend Jesus' sheep is our purpose and our witness. We share grace because his grace is shared with us, no matter what kind of rascal we manage to be. Amen.
So as we go forth from here today, I want you to go wrapped in God's grace. Wrap it around you. Feel it in all parts of your life. His grace is freely offered for you. But when you receive this grace, you need to live into it. Live into his call to tend and to feed his sheep this day and always. Amen. have been worshiping with Centenary United Methodist Church. We thank you for being with us and we pray that you will join us again next week at the same time. Have a good week by God's grace.